Now, reason to bail out. So a central government may tell a state government, we're not going to bail you out. And that's happened several times in the United States, and it's not happened several times. Many people think that Gerald Ford lost the election to um, Jimmy Carter in 1976 because he said, I won't bail out New York City. Okay. Reason to bail out. Now think about this. And keep flipping back to that. Okay. Reason not to reason to bail out. It's a quid pro quo. That's a Latin phrase meaning this for that. Okay. In exchange for paying debts of subordinate governments, I'm going to require that the state government, the subordinate government, rewrite its constitution. They're going to have to restructure your constitution to give the central government more control over the activities of subordinate governments. So the bailout is not going to be free. And my excuse for doing this, well, I can have several excuses, is to avoid moral hazard. If you can notice, we could take this slide and make a whole talk about the banking crisis. So reasons to bail out banks and reasons not to bail out banks and the consequences and the relationship between moral hazard and the demand for regulation of banks. But we won't, we won't go there. Okay, so in exchange, exchange for a bailout, um, you're going to rewrite a constitution. Now let me tell you what I mean by a constitution. Um, so you think, what do you mean by a country's constitution? And like, not, not something you memorized from eighth grade. So, uh, it's tough to define. So I'm going to tell you a description of a constitution. What I mean by constitution, it's going to be a description of who decides what, when. It's going to be a whole tiny protocol of who gets to decide what, when. And constitutions of the United States, it, there's a written constitution that decides that. You know, the president has certain p powers. Legislatures have certain powers. It's all laid out. And there's timing protocols. Big groups of people. Um, I submit that this definition is a um, pretty good definition. It's what, a, what a, it's what, this is an economics, there are econ I, economists here. It's what a game, game theorist would call a game. Description of who decides what, when. Okay, so, so a change in a constitution is you rip up the old one and you have a new timing protocol. Who decides what, when? So a reason to bail out is sometimes you insist that constitutions be changed. So that's a really boring, unromantic way to say it. But here's another way to say it. Fiscal crises, so I've discussed this with Milton Friedman, one of the last conversations I had with him. Fiscal crises often produce political revolutions. That's a more spectacular way to say it. It's also true. Whereby what I mean by a political revolution is a change in the Constitution. So I'll come back to that. Okay. So, now here we go. So those are our basic things, the, our answers to those two questions. So now here we go. Distinct reasons to join a currency union. Okay, so these are going to be two good reasons to join. And, and when I give you these reasons, I want you to think of various, um, not to insult anybody, various European countries. I'll, I'll give them various names since I am an economist. G sub 1, G sub 2. You can think of countries you want to name G sub 1 and G sub 2. Okay. So, Italy, Germany, Spain, Finland, so on. Okay, so reason to join a currency union. By joining a currency union, uh, foreign governments impose discipline that forces your government to balance its budget in a present value sense. So here's what's going on here. If you're a sovereign government and you have your own currency, um, and if you're from China, you know that this happened, you have a printing press and you can you can run the printing press to tax people who hold these. You can generate an inflation tax. 
So this was done in the 30s and 40s in China, and they, they had a hyperinflation. It was done in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. It was done um, in the United States during, the, um, during our Revolutionary War. So if you have this printing press, you can raise revenues. You do it by generating an inflation, and you tax people who are holding currency. And it's a source, if we were going to do accounting, it's a source of revenues in the government budget. And when you join a currency union, oh, by the way, Italy was doing this in the 1970s and 1980s and early 1990s. They were, they were using their printing press to finance part of their revenues. So guess what? They had a high inflation rate. <clears throat> so by joining a currency union, let's say Italy joins with Germany, that's what they did, um, Italy is, is uh, saying, we're going to let the Germans run our monetary system. We're going to tear up our printing press. We're not going to print any of these, and the Germans are going to print the money. That means we're going to have to um, balance our budget in another way. We're going to have to cut expenditures or raise taxes in some other way, but we don't have the printing press. So, so the, way this, the way this distinct reason is, is Italy is forced to behave more like Germany. So that's what it meant when Italy joined that currency union. That's one thing it could have meant. Understand? But it could have meant something else. Here's reason two. By joining a currency union, your government expects the foreign government to finance part of your country's domestic expenditures. So. I'm going to put this in quote. Italians now expect German taxpayers to help fund Italian government expenditures and debt. So we're in a currency union with the Germans. Great. The Germans love to pay taxes. They like to work hard. Let them work a little harder and pay a few more taxes and help fund our early retirement system in Italy. Great. Join the currency union. Okay, so those are two different reasons. And um, so which reason prevailed when they joined the currency union? So what you could say is, uh, well, go look it up, go figure out, look in the documents in the Maastricht Treaty, which it was going to be. You can't find it. You can't find which of those two reasons um, was dominant in 1999 and 2000 when they joined the union. It could have been either one. And it was left ambiguous. Now you could say, let me find out from bondholders, um, from bond spreads. Well, bond spreads in the 1990s, they're high. It, Italy bond rates are high. They reflect big default premium, big inflation to premium. When they join the currency union, they collapse. So the bondholders are thinking, well, Italian bonds are now like German bonds. But why? Do they think the Italians are going to behave like Germans? Or do you think the Germans are going to pay taxes to support the Italian bonds? You can't tell the difference. Both of those would cause the bond spreads. And um, who knows? This is all in the distant future anyway. So these ex our expectations are about things in the future. Okay. So those are distinct reasons. Now I'm going to tell you distinct reasons not to join a currency union. A good reason not to join a currency union. So you should think whether, you should put yourself in a, Actually, people in Hong Kong may be asked to join a currency union someday. Probably not the euro. <laughs> okay, so here's the reason not to join a currency union. To avoid discipline that foreign governments may want to impose on your government's taxes and expenditures. So go back to this one. It's the opposite of this first reason. The Italians may not want to be forced to behave more like Germans. I mean, you've seen movies. Do you want to be more like those happy Italian guys or like those sad German guys working? <laughs> so what do you want? Okay, so those are reasons. Okay, that's where we are. Okay. Good reasons to join a currency union. Okay, so now let's go here. So two reasons to exit a currency union. So there are countries, you know that countries are just thinking about exiting currency unions. So we're just going to use our simple principles. So here's two reasons to exit. And I'm going to come back to my countries G1 and G2 in a minute. 
So one is a fiscally profligate country may want to leave to avoid other governments' threats to impose discipline and control. So read the Financial Times. Every day you see this. So people are talking about, do they think Greece or Italy or Spain is going to use, leave the currency union? But they should also be talking about the following. A fiscally prudent government, think of Germany, may want to leave a currency union to avoid having to bail out or to impose unpleasant discipline on other countries now within the currency union. Germans could get fed up of, go read the Financial Times. They're getting beat up by the other countries um, for being the country that seems not willing to bail out enough and to impose too much austerity. They just may get tired of that. And could they exit the currency union? They could. And there's clever ways they could do it, very gracefully. OK, so that's, those are reasons to exit. OK, so now, um, OK, well, we can ask, who chooses? <clears throat> not economists, um, not political scientists, although we study it. Uh, diverse groups of voters with conflicting interests within, e within each country. There's winners and losers within each country that decide this. OK. <clears throat> So well, that's the cost-benefit analysis. So what I want to do now is talk about a little history. Well, first I'm going to do a hypothetical example. And I'm going to come back to here. Um, reasons not to bail out. Um, or reasons to bail out. So read that second one. Reasons to bail out is a quid pro quo. So in exchange for, for bailing out a subordinate government, so I'm thinking about a, a center or a dominant country bailing out somebody else, assuming their debts. You're going to rewrite a constitution. OK, so now I'm going to tell you a story. So I'm going to use math, G1 and G2. These are just abstract countries, until I tell you a little bit more about them. OK, so think about country G1. So in country G1, um, the people work really hard. They obey the rules. They've had low inflation since the 1950s. They hate inflation. They have a really strong cent They had a really strong central bank. Um, people pay taxes. People go to work. If you pay them, they come to work. Um, they're very rule oriented. A rule's a rule. That's it. They've run a balanced budget, more or less, for years. Low inflation, low government debt to GDP ratio. That's it. That's country G1. Here's country G2. Country G2. Um, you know, people say about this country that people don't work very hard. Um, they have a terribly, their ba budget's been balanced. Their labor, unbalanced for years. They've had high inflation. They have suppressed inflation. They have labor market policies which are, which are terrible and inefficient. They um, subsidize people for not working hard. You see the picture? This is country G2. So think about, the, think about these countries. Um, the currency in country G2 is, is very weak. Big government debts. 